Well, it's great to be here. What a wonderful tradition this is of, uh, you know, a bit of lecturing in the evening and mixed with some drinking of wine and, uh, and sort of discussion. I think it's a um, lovely tradition. So, yes, I would like to tell you a little bit about what's happening in the Alan Turing Institute and um, what our aspirations are and what the sort of process has been over this first year, which uh, since we were sort of in existence as a company, as a charity, um, uh, and, and as we sort of um, set up and, and think our way through the shape that we will take. Um, I have to say this has been a wonderful month spending a year thinking about an institution which is sort of a hallucination and trying to plan for what will what will happen when eventually you get there is um is quite challenging and this month students and research fellows and sort of senior fellows have poured in and so now i'm spending my day talking to these people about science and you know this is um i remember now why why i took the job this is um really is good so um as you say, we are just up the road. We are at the moment in the British Library building and we've, um, we've spent the, the year kind of moving around the library. We began up in the attic on the, on the fourth floor and we've now, uh, we, we then graduated to the first floor at which point it was kind of cleared and hoovered out for us. But, and we decided that hoovering might not be quite enough because um, the eventual plan actually is to build a building um, sort of you know, behind the British Library, but before you get to the Crick, and there's, you might not think it, it just looks like a car park, but there's actually a lot of space there, enough space to build almost the Crick Institute again. And so that's, the plan is really quite a substantial knowledge quarter development. And of course, you know, mostly because of Birkbeck, as, as you pointed out, the knowledge quarter and a few other institutions, the knowledge quarter is, um, uh, is really is quite a brand and, and you know, the potentially, I think, developers who might take up this challenge because um, we would like uh, to see the right kinds of tenants going in there. I mean, uh, we'll be there in the building. The British Library will have a chunk of the building. But, you know, you would hope that the other people who come in would also be sort of knowledge quarter flavoured tenants. And I think they will because I think that any developer will see this as, you know, part of the, the premium that... Uh, this region is um, this region is attracting. So yes, we decided to do a little more than hoovering because we're going to be there probably, you know, optimistically. I think we'll be where we are on the uh, what is it, the eastern wing of the British Library on the first floor for for um, five years, I imagine. And you know, if, if this new development, this new happened in five years, that would be pretty good. And so we thought it was important that people coming in now see a beautiful space and realize that we mean business and that we're doing something special and so we uh, that's what we've done here's a, a little fragment of the of the beautiful space which which we've just had refurbished so what is it that we're going to do people have talked a lot about big data perhaps you're even tired of hearing about big data you know it's undeniably important and um there are the, all these statistics of the kind of more alive than dead kind about how much um, data there is in the world, but the quantity of data, in a way, uh, there's an opportunity there, but it's also a bit depressing because, you know, what on earth do you do with it? It's also expensive. I mean, the government has invested a lot in facilities for storing and handling data, some hundreds of millions, and, um, you know, until you actually do something with the data, it's sitting there as a kind of liability. Um, Mike Lynch, the founder of Autonomy, um, one of the most successful information technology companies we, we've uh, made in this country, puts it very well that, it, that there are businesses for whom information is pouring in in a somewhat unusable form, in the form of free text. It's not in the form uh, of, uh, it's not database ready. It's not ready for, um, for squeezing the knowledge out of it. And so this is a bit of a challenge how, having got the big data, how do you then apply intelligence to automatically, because it would have to be automatically because of the scale, turn it into a form where value can be drawn from it. And an another view from the industry, Gartner's um, very well-known analysts and their vice president is saying, um, first of all, that what is most valuable about many organizations is their store of data, and this is true obviously of companies that run on data, but also of companies that 
you don't think of as data companies, maybe retailers. You know, you'd think, well, or manufacturers, you'd think surely what's valuable about the organization is the stuff they make or their know-how. But increasingly, it's becoming the case that it's the data they, they accumulate about their supply chains, about uh, the, the understanding of their customers, and so on. And so being able to turn that data into valuable material is very important. And so in 2014, the government chief scientific advisor, Mark Wolput, and his team of advisors um, decided to write a letter to the Prime Minister, Cameron, of course, at the time, to say, to point this out, that so much investment had gone into um, housing big data and the big iron for processing it, but where was the research in the algorithms that would actually get the value out of the data? And so that really is the sort of founding assumption of the, of the Alan Turing Institute. And the, the tutorial to the Prime Minister on what is an algorithm cost him around 40 million, and, uh, which I think was a bargain. And that's what's gone into funding the Institute, along with funding from various founding members. So we have, as you probably know, five universities that are founding members, um, Oxford, UCL, Cambridge, Warwick, and Edinburgh, and also EPSRC, who are channeling the 42 million and, uh, and looking after us in various ways. And um, the, the, the universities are putting money in, which is a little unusual. Mostly universities would like the money to travel in the other direction um, uh, with government initi initiatives, but they've put in, as you probably know, five million each over five years. And then we've also been very busy over the last year and a half or so um, building relationships with strategic partners. And we have four of those, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. So um, we've got about, you know, order of 100 million to play with over five years. And so now, having done that work, the challenge is what can we make with that? What can we do with it? The context against which we're working, I think, is very interesting. So if you think about the data economy, it's rather dominated by relatively few players. And there's a very interesting book by Jared, uh, Jared Lanier about... Um, this phenomenon of the tendency to concentrate the ownership of data in fewer and fewer hands. And of course, you know, we all know the companies, the Amazons and Googles and, and so on, and not to mention, if your Russian is not fluent, Yandex and Baidu, the, uh, the Russian and Chinese versions of Google. And so what on earth is a country like the UK going to do in the face of all of this concentration of ownership of data? And are we going to be completely left out of that? And it seems that um, building our own capability to make businesses out of data is going to be incredibly important. And so although you know, we are a research organisation, we're, for example, not a catapult, uh, it's not an applied organisation particularly, it's an uh, Alan Turing Institute is going to encourage and nurture foundational research, but nonetheless we also do aspire to have an impact on this landscape and to do lots that will take our research ideas and take them out um, into places where they can, they can make a difference. So this is the picture with big companies, and we see this concentration. But then when you look at the medium-sized companies, also the picture is similarly about data and how data is powering the growth of companies. And there are lots of great stories here. So uh, I suppose, you know, Tesla is, the, is one that we've heard an awful lot about recently, and of course some of the stories send a bit of a shiver down the spine, but uh, this is um, very exciting stuff. One of my colleagues in Microsoft who was working on virtual reality got picked out as the new vice president for autonomous driving at Tesla, which you know, must just be one of the world's dream jobs, don't you think? Uh, except perhaps when the, uh, the press beat up after your door because your car has just has just done away with somebody. But, I mean, you know, you have to read the label. It says, you know, this is not an autonomous car. It's, um, it's uh, driver assistance. But it's very interesting. I think the Tesla phenomenon is fascinating, that it's a new car company whose valuation, market capitalization, is chasing the market capitalization of the established players like Mercedes, uh, you know, Daimler-Benz, who've been, been here for 100 years. And yet, with this, uh, I the, the power of information, and machine learning and so on behind them, they're able in just three or four years to become major players in 
um, in the marketplace. And of course, then you see also the very interesting effect that has on the established car manufacturers. So they're now buying major information technology companies. And um, of course, they don't want to lose the battle for what goes on behind the dashboard of their cars. All of that um, kind of engineering information, but also navigation and entertainment. Are they going to lose all of that to, to Google or are they going to uh, retain that as one of the principal pieces of, of value now in, in the modern sort of instantiation of their industry? Um, Netflix, you know, it's all about understanding the customer. It's all about using machine learning to track the behavior of customers, to use the behavior of one customer to guess what the behavior of another customer might be. There was the famous, uh, you probably all know about it, the Netflix challenge where they published a lot of their data and invited researchers to compete building algorithms that would do the best prediction and then I mean it wasn't just for fun I mean they really did hire the team that did it and uh, um, and they adopted those methods at the time for um, doing prediction and oh well this one is Dyson of course who uh, who makes um, the most beautiful vacuum cleaners so I mean uh, you know we're, we're we're familiar with the one that they kind of um, hand operated vacuum cleaners, but have you seen the latest robot vacuum cleaners? I, I, I saw a demo of one. It was um, hoovering the floor of the Royal Society. At the moment, you can only get them in Japan. They're, they're, really, they're only about this big and they cost about $700. It's quite a lot for a, a vacuum cleaner, but it's so beautiful. Um, and it's um, the thing that's interesting about them, of course, there have been robot vacuum cleaners before that kind of bounce around your environment and uh, uh, move kind of at random, avoiding the chair legs. The special thing about this one is it has artificial intelligence vision built into it. And it's looking at the, at the ceiling and, and the walls, uh, remembering landmarks and using that to kind of raster scan the space efficiently um, so that it does the hoovering much faster. And, um, or should I say, the Dysoning. And it's just amazing that this is, these technologies, artificial in te intelligence technologies are what are powering these, these new companies. Um, and then at the smaller scale, you see the very rapid growth. Uh, of course, in, in London, we have DeepMind, a fantastic outcome from fundamental research that has, has become, you know, it was worth half, half a billion in, after just three or four years of existence. It's just um, uh, amazing to see that a company which has, doesn't have a product, simply has great ideas, can be sold for that kind of value. Um, Siri, the, the personal assistant on the, on the Apple phone, was a, a, a company that spun out of SRI research in, uh, in California and Apple picked that up for a song for, for 100 million, and, and, you know, for, which for them is small change and yet it's a kind of fundamental part of their, of their offering and of their reputation. And other stories, Nest uh, uh, sold to Google, Mobileye you may not know, um, is actually what is powering autonomous driving in just about every car except Mercedes and Tesla who have their own technology. But um, all of the others are buying into Mobileye. In fact, Mobileye had a, a rather public spat with Tesla recently. I don't know if you, you might have spotted that, that around the time of the, of the bad, bad news for, for Tesla, Mobileye uh, decided that Tesla were being a bit cavalier and, and they kind of, they, their relationship is... Um, uh, broken up. So all these very interesting things happening. The most recent one actually, Vocal IQ, is a Cambridge company spun out of the engineering department that does dialogue systems. So you, it's always about restaurants, isn't it? I don't know why. You, you phone this thing up and you ask, where can I get a decent pizza? Or, I mean, I, I, I've not, never wanted to do this myself, but this, is, um, this apparently is what's coming. And, but the technology is, is fantastic. And uh, um, Apple bought it, 100 million. I mean, you know, any of our, uh, you know, the big British uh, or the, uh, FTSE 100 companies could have done this. I mean, that technology, 100 million to become expert in this um, speech driven dialogue technology is in some ways a snip. Um, and so important, I think, for, for the growth of um, uh, the creation of wealth in, in, in the future. So that's what the Institute is about. It's about... Um, developing data science, the fundamentals in order to power these kinds of developments. And um, I think a very good question, which you might be asking, uh, thinking of asking me, so I'll preempt you, is um, what can we do that our great universities can't do? I mean, um, you know, the UK has every reason to be proud of its universities. It's, it's one of the things that we do best. I mean, arguably, 
we do it best in the world when you see how many we have in the top 10 and then the top 100 as a, in relation to the size of the country. I mean, we are, we are fantastic performers. And five of those great universities are our members. So um, how are we going to kind of do things better than they do it? And by the way, another thing which perhaps we'll talk about later is, um, you know, what will be our relationship with the universities of the UK? Are we going to devote our attention entirely to these, um, these five? Answer, no. We are, we are coming the way of the other universities, it's, but it's taking us a bit longer. I'd be very interested to talk with people about that later. So here we are. We, we are building an institute um, without disciplinary boundaries that um, we have mathematicians, we have statisticians, we have computer scientists, I mean, I think, you know, if, if I were to try and summarise what data science is about, I think at the core of it, you have a sort of collision between statistics and computer science. I think that's the sort of um, where it all begins. And um, a statistician, for the most part, a research statistician is a species of mathematician. They like to do things right. They like to, you know, they like to prove theorems. They like to do things that uh, uh, correctly. Computer scientists say this because I suppose I am one, um, perhaps a little more cavalier, you know, if we're, um, so if you, if you present a problem which is a little bit too hard to a, um, a statistician, they may say, I think, well, that's a little bit out of scope at the moment, ask again in a few years and we'll, we'll try it. Whereas you give the same data to a computer scientist and say, well, can you analyse this? They'll say, well, you know, we don't really have the methods, but this data is so important, we must try something. And so... That, that, that's sort of one aspect of the difference of cultures, but there are other things. Statisticians have exact um, and precise methods at their fingertips. Computer science these days, amongst other things, is very concerned with scaling things up. So it's all very well to do an analysis which you can do on your desktop. Of course, you can fit quite a lot onto your desktop at the moment. But what about when you're trying to run a service, like, shall we say, Facebook is running, or actually any commercial service, like, I don't know, hotels.com or Expedia, and typically the scale of those services, which you want to be analysing constantly so as to keep abreast of the thinking of your customers, um, that can't be done just on a laptop. That has to be done in a data centre. So the topic of s distributing computations throughout a data centre is terribly important and non-trivial. At least, you know, it depends on the computation. Some computations can be very easily split up into parcels and, and spread across multiple processes, but others are kind of intimately coupled and so the then the challenge of splitting them up is a fascinating one in 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 kind of the methodology of computer science computer scientists are also very concerned with um, the scaling behavior of algorithms if you double you know if you're searching for somebody's name in the in a, in a directory and you now um, get a directory that's 10 times larger is it going to take 10 times as much work to search for the name you hope not and these are the kinds of questions that complexity theory in computer science um, um, addresses so i think it's very important this um the, the collision between computer science and uh, statistics the statistician david donahoe in stanford has written very elo eloquently about about this and i i i go with that um, but also other disciplines which I think are going to be very important to our mission. So mathematics, I think it's not completely obvious that you would have mathematics in a data science institute. Some do, some don't. But for us, having some fundamental mathematics, looking in a radical way at the way data can be represented and the way um, uh, inference can be done over data, and maybe coming up with some off-the-wall ideas from geometry and topology about how to think about data, this is, this is a bet we want to place. And so we have some mathematicians in the, uh, uh, in the institute. Now, the social scientists um, won't, uh, won't let us get away either with simply collapsing in onto our own geekdom. You know, imagine a, a community of statisticians, computer science and uh, mathematicians. We could um, be uh, completely taken up with our own technology. But the social scientists, I'm very happy to say, are going to keep us real. And, for example, you know, government, of course, is a major sponsor for us that puts a lot of money in. And we're very keen to... Um, help government solving its um, problems with big data. Anything from the delivery of services and the understanding of uh, whether services like, um, like uh, the, the ones that the Department of Work and Pensions deliver are being delivered effectively, um, to citizen access to information. You know, is it really you know, there's a lot of open, uh, open data on the web, but can citizens really get at it and, and make anything of it? Is there something we can do to make that all uh, much more accessible? So. 
And I think the connection with social science will be a kind of two-way connection. That is to say, the methods that get developed down here in mathematics and computer science and so on are already revolutionizing social science. One example would be the way social scientists now think about networks. And the mathematics of networks is feeding into social science research on social networks and other kinds of uh, other kinds of networks involving people. Um, but uh, also I think there'll be a lot of traffic in the other direction where social scientists are feeding in, for example, concerns about ethics. And of course this is something we have to think about very hard. So, um, you know, in the computer science box we're doing a lot of work on machine learning and one of the very interesting concerns in machine learning is um, whether the decisions that automated processes make are understandable to the ordinary human being. And this is not just a kind of um, uh, an idea, this is something which is coming to, uh, coming to fruition soon because the European Union has agreed that in 2018 new regulations will come in where any decision that is made by an automated process about a citizen must explain itself if required. And this is interesting because the kind of latest wave of technology and machine learning is all about black box classify, uh, classification. So um, it's something which is a, a sort of rather inscrutable process. I, if I have time, I'll come back to this later. Where you, um, uh, you feed information into, a, into the black box. It learns a rule for, let's say, classifying credit risk. And now as, a, as an ordinary citizen, you get turned down for credit. And the system says, well, Sorry, it's just the rule I learned. I looked at, you know, 100,000 people and we w looked at the ones that, that paid their debts and the ones that didn't. And this is the rule that emerged. And, you know, in some sense, that's very reasonable, but it's not very satisfying for the citizen who would like a little bit more structure to the decision. And so I, I think this is one of the uh, one of the challenges, which is, you know, it has a, an ethical dimension. It has a regulatory dimension, but it also has, it is also prov uh, provocative for science you know how can science and technology help with delivering systems which do the job of classification well and yet give explanations so I think this is something that's um, very interesting that is uh, that is um, coming our way well let me um, show you our the slide the one slide that kind of summarizes what we're what we've arrived at in the way of scientific strategy so we think of this as, as a structure with six verticals, meaning six um, challenges, uh, um, challenge areas that we want to tackle, and four horizontals, meaning four different kinds of technology. And so I want to talk a little bit about um, each of those. And um, so in each of these verticals, th this is probably a good time to talk a little bit about our strategic partners, because Either we have a strategic partner for the vertical or we would like one. We have at the moment four strategic partners. So, for example, in engineering, which is all about using data to inform the design of engineering systems. I mean, what would be an example? Um, something that we're thinking hard about is how complex machines like turbines can be efficiently diagnosed. So um, your typical turbine that you might find in a power station is pouring out data at a great rate of knots and... Um, you know, you could sort of store this, but um, how on earth are you going to get value out of it? You'd like to be, as it were, listening carefully to every bearing and every, uh, you know, c uh, combustion process and so on, and hearing the telltale signs that might be saying uh, early diagnosis is needed. Actually, Rolls-Royce have something like this. If you ever visit Rolls-Royce, I've been there to the kind of nerve centre, and they have this room in the, in the middle with a kind of leaderboard on it um, with all of the engines that are currently in the air. And the ones at the top, you don't want to be on that plane. Um, and, um, you know, the one at the top, uh, the plane will get home. But when it gets there, that engine is going into the hangar for early maintenance. And, um, uh, and that's all because of this thing about, you know, listening to all of the, uh, all of the sensors, uh, temperature and pressure and so on, that are on the engine. So um, we'd love to be able to do that kind of thing and, and other challenges in engineering. Lloyd's Register Foundation are our are our sponsors for that. Um, technology, we're thinking very hard about what computers will need to look like to service data science. And 
Um, this is rather a challenging area. Our partners here are Intel, and they are highly provoked by a company called NVIDIA. I don't know how some of you who are in computer science will know NVIDIA. What they do is they make the um, specialised processors that are inside actually ordinary computers but are specialised for game playing. And inside computers that are good at game playing, the, the, um, the graphics processor unit is kind of exaggerated. You know, you get a big one inside those computers. And these things are designed for shading the screen. I mean, they are specialised processors whose, whose job in life is to colour in the screen, all the, all the pixels of the screen. But some rather clever machine learning um, researchers, actually some of them were in, in my lab in Cambridge, worked out that you can do some things with these processes they were really never designed to do. So, for example, the thing that we did in my lab was um, to do with decision trees. So one, one form of black, black box classifier uses decision trees, asking 20 questions, as it were, to get to a classification. And decision trees, you know, they're sort of messy things where you can't sort of say how big they're going to be. They don't fit into a rectangle the way the screen of your computer does. So it doesn't really look as if these graphics processor units would be good at processing decision trees. But some very ingenious people have worked out uh, ingenious engineers how to pack decision trees into the graphics processor units and get work done on them. And when you do that, the tr the, this, is, this for us was very important because the training time for training a decision tree went down from a week or two to a day. And in the software industry, there's the notion of the daily build. You know, when you're developing a system, you rebuild it every day and retest it. And so you really need to get your systems learning at the speed of the daily build. And uh, the, the graphics processor unit enables us to do that. More recently, the, the latest kind of um, uh, trend that has swept the world in, in machine learning is deep neural networks. So th this is a bit shocking to me, to be honest, because you know, I spent most of my life thinking about probability and automated inference and the idea that there's no reason why our artificial intelligence solution should look anything like the solution in the brain. No, why should it? We, it's a different context. We're using silicon, not carbon. Uh, they could be quite different, and, and that's what I've been working on. And then in 2010, I think I may get to this later, the, the world sort of changed, and, uh, and it turned out that the neural network kind of simulations, they're not really very, uh, they're not accurately brain-like, but they're kind of dr deriving inspiration from the brain, that these um, technologies uh, all of a sudden started winning all the competi competitions. And I've got one or two slides that illustrate it later. And uh, so, uh, and th then the ingenious researchers worked out that these deep neural networks could also be packed into the graphics processor unit of the NVIDIA chip. And of course, Intel um, were horrified because, you know, they own a lot of the world's large scale computing. And, and um, NVIDIA, to be honest, were rather lucky because it, it wasn't NVIDIA that worked this out. It was, it was kind of academic researchers. But NVIDIA have also been very quick to capitalize on this and redesign their graphics processor units so that now they, um, uh, they do these uh, black box classifiers very well. So, OK, that was rather a long story. That's how Intel come to be working with us to try to design new chips both from the point of view of, of, of the hardware, but also talking to the statisticians and the computer scientists about what are the algorithms that are going to be running in the data centers in five years' time, and how can we kind of optimize the, the uh, structure of the chips to do that. Um, what else do we have? Future cities. Uh, urban analytics, that's something we feel in our bones we very much want to do, but we don't actually have a strategic partner to do that, so that's one where we'll continue to look. Financial services, of course, a sort of very obvious setting for big data. We didn't have a strategic partner there until last Tuesday, it was. Well, of course, it did take a little bit longer than one day to set this up. But Tuesday, we announced that with HSBC, we now have a partnership, which is all about using HSBC's own data to do research in economics and sort of macroeconomics. And um, I didn't completely sort of get how this was work, going to work. I kind of I was trusting the chaps from HSBC until they pointed out that they actually have more than 10% of all the world's trade is flowing through their servers. So it's not 100% of the world's trade, but that's a pretty good sample. And, um, uh, and, and the point is, I mean, of course, the Bank of England, you know, has data on trade. And in some sense, they have data on 100% on of the world's trade, but at a very, very much coarser granularity. So in HSBC, they really are seeing every transaction in that more than 10% slice. So 
perhaps we can somehow, you know, put together what the Bank of England has with what HSBC has and sort of fill in this space and get amazing detail about the understanding of trading flows. And guess what? Since Brexit, you know, there's a lot of interest in trading flows. So I think that's going to be very, very interesting. Um, the uh, defence and security, we have GCHQ and DSTL, the defence laboratories have also come in as, as a major partner. Not because we're going to start working on secret data, because it's not practical to do that, even if we wanted to in, in an open environment, but because they're very worried about the shortage of talent in, in data science analytics. Of course, they have cryptographic talent, that's their core business, but they, you know, in recent years they've realised how important data analytics is, they've built their own teams, and so they've got a, a big interest in working with us to kind of develop the pool of talent, which is a lot of what we're about, by the way. I mean, there are three things that we're about. We want to do the fundamental research. We want to train the new generation of researchers in data analytics, and we want to make a difference by delivering some of our, um, uh, some of our technologies to where it can make that difference. And by the way, that was the last box on my diagram that I didn't mention before, software engineers. And I think th this is, if you like, my personal bet, and I'm doing my best to convince them, my board that this is a good idea. I think this is one of the things we can do that answers this question about how can we do something additional to what universities, our great universities, can already do. And I think this may be one of the things, that we build a substantial engineering team which draws people together on on some bigger challenges where we, for example, build infrastructure that can help researchers all around the country to do particular kinds of research, but also occasionally deliver a piece of software into the open source arena that makes a difference. I have huge envy of um, University of California in Berkeley who have kind of done amazing things distributing pieces of software like Spark is, is a piece of software that is that allows you to do amazing things in data centers at a time and done at a time when people didn't quite know how to do data center processing so uh, you know we can't do spark because it's been done but that's the kind of that's the kind of level at which i would aspire for us to work that we kind of finger one or two key uh, areas of technology where we can um, do something special and um, and then and th we deliver that so let me just spend 10 minutes illustrating a few of the bits of science that we're, that we're already um, thinking about. Of course, what I'm going to show you for the most part is things which the researchers in the Institute have been doing over the last few years and which they're kind of bringing with them to play with in the Institute. I can't tell you many of the things we've done in the Institute because we've only been running for three weeks. But um, actually, we did a few things over the summer as well, um, sort of warm-ups. Um, and there is one thing which, um, amazingly, uh, even in, in the timescale of a month or two, is uh, uh, already things are happening. So one thing I wanted to talk about is um, the theme of resilient networks, which is part of our, our work in engineering under Lloyd's Register Foundation, and also our thinking about um, urban analytics, and the kind of intersection of those challenges with our ability to um, think of new ways of representing data using mathematics. And so we've got quite a few teams coming together to, to kind of build a capability in this area. One of the teams is from Cambridge and they've been doing some rather neat work in Cambridge trying to work out how traffic flows in the city. And actually this theme of resilient network, it's all about urban flows, whether it's traffic or pedestrians or energy um, or water or um, uh, the, the way... Um, uh, uh, charging of electric vehicles will be done ar around the city and how that that will be managed all these kinds of flows um, one of our one of our researchers um, looks at the flow of, of bad behavior uh, in the city uh, following the Tottenham riots you know trying to work out where um, where uh, civil disobedience was likely to break out um, almost modeling disobedience as a fluid I mean I find this paper is stretching the imagination um, so what about the flow of traffic? Of course, what you could do, and this is actually a good idea, is to distribute sensors all around the city, which are you know, under the road and so on, and the traffic lights, which are um, uh, measuring traffic flows. And undoubtedly, you know, that does happen and, and will happen more. But supposing you wanted to do a sort of ad hoc measurement of flow, well, uh, 
the Richard Gibbons and his colleagues in Cambridge had this idea of, of using buses because the buses already have GPS on them and are kind of harnessed together in one system so you can get a reports from the GPS and um, so you could use the, the movement of the bus as a kind of proxy for the movement of the traffic. Well, of course, it doesn't take much thought to realise that this is a partly flawed idea because, you know, what about bus stops? I mean, this is, the, you know, the traffic goes on by and the bus stops. But um, this kind of idea of, of reusing broken data, um, by the way, they tested it out uh, at a time when there was an incident, a, cr a crash in the Cambridge road network and so they were sort of trying to measure what was the the influence of this um, of the crash on the flow of traffic and so they, all they had to do that was this rather flawed data the GPS from the buses which is sometimes moving the traffic flow and sometimes doing some other funny thing and but statisticians love this because it means they can use all their smarts to work out where the defects are in the data are and this is actually a prevalent theme in data analytics that it's very rare that you get handed data in beautiful condition ready for inference and so actually a rather a large part of the of the job is to to um, sometimes this is done by hand to kind of spot um, defects in the data either errors or missing data but of course in big data you can't really do that by hand so for us this is going to be a major theme using automated analysis to kind of um, repair the the data or perhaps a, a slightly more safely to make um, inference processes that can tolerate gaps and inaccuracies in data and so this is what they did they uh, they um, built statistical models that knew about the things that buses do other than simply flowing the traffic and built in statistical inference mechanisms that would would spot those things happening and um, and then you sort of see the before and after this is an ordinary day in Cambridge where um, red is bad because it means the traffic is not moving and blue is lovely free-flowing traffic and uh, well you know even on a good day in Cambridge there are a few patches of red um, actually you know Cambridge they were actually thinking of putting in congestion charges they, they, they think they have congestion they, they, they've ever been to a proper city and seen what real congestion looks like but anyway the, the, I stray into politics here um, but you see on the, the day that the accident happened uh, which is uh, the accident uh, is, is there on the red circle and over a, uh, over a period of tens of minutes the influence of that stoppage uh, is kind of, kind of flowed out all through the city and uh, bunged up all the roads and so they're able to able to do that um, that inference um, let me show you just one last thing so I wanted to tell you about the amazing research progress we've made in just two months um, and this is about combining machine learning with ideas about mathematical representations of data. The initial challenge that these researchers from Oxford um, took on, and this is some while ago, was the reading of Chinese characters. And of course, you know, Chinese characters in some sense are shapes. Um, this apparently says, Al, uh, Alan Turing, uh, this says Turing. So this is a, that, that is the syllable chur and that's the syllable ing. I don't know if any of you can, can do that. I mean, you know, it, I was told this. I think it must be right. I, I have no, here we are. Here are the printed characters corresponding to these two examples of written characters. And so the challenge is to get from here to here. How can you use automated analysis to infer the printed characters from the, from the written characters? And it turns out that there's a branch of mathematics which would appear to be entirely unrelated to this. And this is the, the mathematics of rough paths, so-called. Here's a book from Martin Hira in uh, Warwick University who just won the Fields Medal, which is the Nobel Prize of Mathematics for, um, um, for his work on rough paths. And Terry Lyons is the re Oxford researcher who sort of started the whole thing about rough paths. What's it to do with it? It's actually a way of studying random processes like Brownian motion, where you know smoke particles bounce around because they're being hit by molecules. And you look in the microscope and you can see the random motion of the smoke particles. And that's governed by a differential equation, a stochastic differential equation. And to study those, you use these rough, rough paths. And I was a bit baffled as to how um, this, these uh, mathematical ideas could help with practical classification of shapes. So I got Terry Lyons into my office to try and explain it, and this is this is what he drew on my desk. And um, the bit that I understood is that, um, well, you know, here is a, 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 a an example of a path, uh, um, you know, rather like the stroke in a 
Chinese character, and you build what's called a signature, which is a kind of summary of that shape. And the signature is a, uh, a series of measures getting more and more complex that sort of appear in a natural sequence, um, in some ways a little bit like a Fourier sequence or a Taylor series for those of you that are mathematically oriented. But suffice it to say, the sort of first measure is just the, the distance between the endpoints of the path. That's a sort of absolute base level measure, sort of useful, but it clearly doesn't tell you much about the shape. The next level of measure is the signed area, where you draw this line and you count that as positive area and that as negative area, so there's some, some total negative area. Mathematicians don't seem to be worried about the net area coming out negative. And so that would be your next measure. And you can go on with a natural sequence of things which become actually a little less intuitive. Um, but, you know, these two, first two which are intuitive uh, sort of show the way ahead. And they, they use this to do the classification of Chinese characters, splitting the characters up into individual strokes and then uh, classifying the, the strokes into... In, these little ladders here are just uh, a little pictorial representation of this signature. It doesn't really tell you much about what's in there, but just the idea that you collect signatures from the different substrokes of the character and that you can use that for classification. And what they're doing now is uh, um, trying to use these ideas in a kind of, um, what should we say, in a hierarchical fashion. So the, the problem is to classify the movement of humans that are walking around. So you've got various different kinds of movement. There's a human who's been captured with a, uh, an electronic rig doing a golf swing and um, here's another one that's doing a kind of kicking action for football and actually there are, there are dozens of these that have been collected and lots of data sets uh, uh, for each action and so the challenge and this is this has become a sort of standard data set that machine learning um, researchers like to compete uh, to, to, to see how well they can do uh, do at this and um, and so now they're using signatures of signatures, kind of hierarchical, a hierarchical idea of signatures to try and solve this problem. And in four weeks, they've already hit, uh, reached the state of the art. So they're now kind of neck and neck with researchers who are doing this using completely different methods. And of course, the hope is that, that it hasn't plateaued out at four weeks and that there's, um, that, uh, given another four weeks, they'll be the world champions. And by the way, th this way of working is very interesting, something that's emerged that David Donohoe, who I mentioned earlier from Stanford, the statistician who writes a lot about, about um, what is data science, this is one of the things that he picked out, the common task framework, he calls it, this idea of mounting competitions, a bit like the Netflix challenge, and that this has become really a new paradigm in science, that um, you can see the, the appeal of it. I mean, there's been a lot of scandal recently about reproducibility in science, and so defining standard challenges that people have to... Uh, compete on exactly the same data and very often they're not allowed to see the data so rather than pulling the data down into your laboratory and running your algorithms on it you have to send your algorithm off to the host of the data and they run it so it's all very kind of um, all very controlled and very fair and well this whole business of reproducibility actually is something which is exercising us a lot because setting out as a new institute we want to do things in a way that will kind of um, uh, support reproducibility as much as possible I think it's a um, uh, really is a challenge for scientists at the moment. Well, I guess I'll... Um, let me just say one last thing. You know, I talked a little bit about deep neural networks. Here, for what it's worth, is a picture of a deep neural network. This is um, the, the, the craze that is sweeping um, uh, machine learning and indeed computer science. Um, DeepMind, the, the company uh, from London that was bought by Google, one of the reasons that they bought them was because they were, um, they were using this technology very effectively. Um, Jeffrey Hinton, there he is, uh, is one of the pioneers of this, uh, of this idea. He's been saying for you know, more than 30 years that imitating, sort of, uh, imitating coarsely the network structure of the brain and building classifiers built on it is the way to go ahead. And nobody believed him. There's been several waves of disbelief. And he, you know, he, he popped up once or twice, you know, once in the 80s. And then, uh, then again, in the, and nobody really believed it. I certainly didn't believe it. And um, I always found his lectures quite difficult to understand. And I was taking comfort in the thought that perhaps I didn't need to understand them. But it turns out that was completely wrong. And, um, and so these networks have really taken the world by storm. Just to see what kind of effect they had. Uh, here is a graph 
of one of these standard tests, the, co the Common Task Framework idea from NIST, the National Institute of Standards in the US. It was a, a speech classification uh, test and then you see over the early years up to the, the beginning of the millennium, a lot of progress was made with what they call hidden Markov models, which some of you will, will know about. And then in 2000 and from 2000, 2008 or so, it really plateaued. And that's not because no one was trying. Um, the researchers were trying everything they knew to try and improve the state of the art at speech recognition. And it was sort of settling at this rather useless 25% level, which is really not, well, you know, some of you may have done battle with the speech uh, dictation systems of the, of the era. And, you know, getting one word in four wrong really is not useful. And, um, but, uh, and as I say, there, it was, there was an obvious premium to getting this right, and, and yet people couldn't do it. And then what happened was, um, oops, was that uh, deep neural networks um, came back into vogue around 2009, and you see over just a few years the error rates have plummeted. I mean, this graph could have been, you know, could, we could have could have shown it to more advantage on a log scale. I mean, what's happening here is, you know, a reduction of uh, three or four to one in error rate. And what we've got here is another reduction of three to one in error rate. And that's coming, it's come down now to the 6% range, which you might think, oh, 6% not bad, one word in 20 wrong, that's still a bit annoying. But actually humans can't do better than that. That is a pretty much human level performance. So um, maybe one can't get much better than that. Um, uh, but at any rate, it ought to be good enough for very, very useful performance. And indeed, the speech systems we have now on our phones, which of course are not really translating speech on the phone, they're really relaying the things you say to a data center and then doing the translation and then sending the result back, um, are, are benefiting from this. And um, well, amazing things are being done with this technology now. People are able to use a combination of, of um, deep neural networks for image processing with deep neural networks for language to um, label an entire image, not just, you know, cat, a woman, and so on. I don't think it's a cat, is it? It's a, a lot of hair on her shoulder, but hey, a reasonable error. Um, <laughs> and the output of this, this process is an entire caption at a rather factual level, nothing about any sort of hidden concepts that, uh, you know, that there might be in this, uh, this image, like this lady is, you know, masking a lot of other people, but a sort of rather factual description of what what you can see, perhaps what a three-year-old might be able to do describing this image. And indeed, um, Professor Fei-Fei Li uh, from Stanford has stood up at her TED talk and said, well, you know, her, her group has done one of the versions of this um, caption labeling challenge. She said, well, you know, we, we've, our robots are actually now, they've reached the level of performance of a three-year-old. Um, maybe a bit of a bold claim, but um, perhaps there, there may be some missing dimensions of the capability of a three-year-old, but actually there's something there. And so she says, you know, we've got up as far as a three-year-old and on to 13. Um, but before, you know, hubris takes over and we think we, we, we've kind of solved everything, let me just point out, and this is really the last thing I'm going to say, there are still some things we can't do. Here's a great example. So supposing your three-year-old or, or maybe two-year-old was learning a concept like what is a car and you show the two-year-old um, a few dozen cars and if it were a computer you'd be showing maybe a thousand cars. That's the sort of, that's the, the, the amount of data that seems to be needed at the moment to make these things work mechanically. But, you know, a few dozen might be enough for the child. And then they, uh, they, they learn what a car is. Now you show them a lorry. And how many lorries are they going to need to see before they, they, they get what a lorry is. It's not going to be a few hundred again. They, somehow, uh, because of the similarity, because the lorry is related to the car, um, you know, might be two lorries. Maybe they'll get it in two lorries, but it's not going to be hundreds. And this is something we simply can't do with our neural networks at the moment. So this, I think, is one of the fascinating challenges that, that is up ahead. And I, I have some ideas about what might work here, but um, there, there are probably as many ideas about what will work as there are researchers. Um, you can do these experiments with humans as well. Uh, MIT have done experiments with what they, with these artificial, you know, computer generated objects that they call tufas. And the moral of this tale is that you show a human three tufas and they can now, that's enough, they can now classify tufas quite reliably, even though this is clearly a domain, you know, if you were a, um, a mushroom specialist, maybe 
you'd be very well equipped to do this, I don't know. But you know, this is, for most of us, a largely unfamiliar domain. And, um, and uh, uh, so I think this is, this is a, a very interesting challenge that lies ahead. So there we are. Let me just leave you with the, the map of, the, of our strategic priorities, the challenges that we're trying to tackle, the, um, the kind of institute without boundaries methodology that we're, we're trying to, to use to tackle it. It's one of the things we have is a long space in the British Library, the length of three cricket pitches or so. With um, There are no department, no walls between departments. We're all kind of mixed in together. And I think that's a very interesting part of the, the recipe, which is actually also quite difficult to reproduce um, typically in a university. So yes, walls without boundaries, um, strong engineering, fantastic location in uh, in central London, near to the banking district and the seat of government, and where uh, the crossroads of uh, you know people's travels through the UK. I think we've got a very interesting recipe. Um, still a big challenge to make magic out of this recipe, and uh, I hope many of our academic colleagues around the, the country will be helping us to do it. Thanks very much. We've got some time for questions, if anyone has, about 10-15 minutes. Right, okay, you're the first. Um, you spend quite a lot. Maybe you should stand up and speak loudly, oh, yeah. so I won't have to repeat it. <laughs> um, you spent quite a lot of time talking about GPUs and oh, yes. novel, ar novel architecture. Yeah. Are you concerned in any way that you need to rebuild your technology every time a, a novel architecture comes out? Are GPUs mature yet? Well, I mean, GPUs are mature for what they're designed to do, which is to make great gaming consoles and yeah. to do graphics really well and video and, and that kind of thing. Um, if, uh, but to do data science, of course, you know, you wouldn't start from there in a rational world. It's a piece of serendipity that that's how the science developed. And so um, I think absolutely no, we don't have the mature technology. And that, and that really is the challenge, I think, for our program with Intel and, and we're not deluding ourselves that we're going to be the only people in the world doing this and indeed you know um, hardware is already coming out so Google has their TensorFlow library for doing machine learning and but there's also the TPU the TensorFlow processing unit which um, they're not distributing to the world they're going to put that in their data centers so the um, the TensorFlow software is the loss leader as it were that draws you into their data centers so that they can then make business with their with their TPU so you can sort of see how the um, computing companies of the world are taking this very seriously um, Microsoft has just built something called the catapult which uh, recently a couple of weeks ago they were boasting how they'd used it to translate the whole of Wikipedia in a few seconds and um, so these kind of specialist processors are um, people are realizing the potential of, um, of building them and so of course um, with Intel we hope we'll get something which you know will captures the workloads that the data centers are going to be seeing in you know three four or five years any other questions <laughs> you mentioned um, with artificial neural networks yeah. the, um, the difficulty in trying to um, get out of this black box thing where you can't yes. explain why it's made, made the decision. Uh, can you see any way forward? Because uh, mm. at the moment, we, uh, it's, uh, it really is a problem. It is a problem, and I think there are lots of interesting ways to think about it. I mean, um, actually, another of the interesting sort of contrast between the statistics uh, sort of um, uh, uh, culture and the, and the computing culture is, is sort of precisely in this area so the black box is very much beloved of the computer scientists statisticians um, rather prefer something which i must admit i i rather like these two uh, um, generative models where you get a where you have a model it's rather interesting the way it works supposing you have some some data that you got by i don't know testing a patient you you measure the temperature and you felt a lump around the abdomen and various uh, various sort of things that you observed and then you've got some hypotheses that you want to, to explore about is this indigestion or is it, um, is it appendicitis or you know, what might it be? And the way generative models work is, and forgive me if you're familiar with this, is that um, 
uh, you go backwards. You start with the hypothesis. You say, well, if there were appendicitis here via various intermediate steps of reasoning are the things that you would observe as a, as a doctor. And then the kind of magic of the algorithms for inference that are used is it sort of reverses that logic completely automatically. And um, I don't know, do you know David Spiegelhalter? He's a statistician in Cambridge who's quite often on Radio 4. These days he talks about the public understanding of risk. And uh, uh, he is one of the inventors of the algorithms that reverse this flow of information in this rather amazing way. And um, so those algorithms, they can also be used to make predictions. That's what happens when you reverse the flow. You make the prediction about which of the hypotheses is true. But because you have this structured model, you've also got some intermediate kind of pieces of information which help to make a kind of step-by-step -step explanation of how you arrived at your decision. So that's, that's the good thing about those models, but the bad thing is they can't quite compete on accuracy with these black box models. So, you know, the, there are interesting questions here technically and, if you like, ethically. Would you give up accuracy in order to get more explanatory power? So maybe you're not so good now at working out who should have credit and who shouldn't, but in exchange for that you can at least explain your decision. If you're a, uh, a junior medic, I think it's, it's a sort of a no-brainer. Um, if you sent somebody home who had appendicitis, you absolutely don't want to be saying to your, your consultant boss in the morning, well, the black box said send him home. You know, you, would, you really need to be able to say something about what the chain of reasoning was that, that led to that decision. But um, there's been a bit of a flurry of papers in the last year or two about, on these issues, and there are some other ideas as well about how you might be able to have your cake and eat it. So, you know, there are some ideas about, you know, okay, use the black box, that's fine. But when the request comes in, the sort of freedom of information request or something about how did you reach that decision, then you kind of go back to the black box and the particular query that was asked and you sort of, I don't know, you know, uh, I don't have time really to, to sort of explain this very much, but you kind of dig into how the black box was operating in the region of that query, in the region of, in some mathematical sense. You kind of expand the back black box in its operation in the vicinity of that query and you get a kind of more detailed uh, oper uh, explanation of not the general operation of the black box, but how it worked for that query. And, and, and there are lots of other ideas rather like that about uh, sort of, um, well, of course, one of the very interesting uh, topics that is adjacent to this one is how do you stop the black box using criteria that you really wouldn't uh, want to be used? For example, using gender to decide whether you're a good credit risk. Uh, you know, we can't do this anymore with insurance. It used to be okay with car insurance to use gender. Now it's illegal. And so you would need to be able to stop your, your black box using gender. But how do you do that? Well, of course, it's very easy just to remove the, the gender token from the database, but that's not good enough because you might have used incidental information, which is tantamount to having um, uh, classified gender. And so you'd even like to, to stop that. And some uh, researchers at the Max Planck Institute in Saarbrück and uh, recently published some very interesting ideas about how you might do that. Um, I think we have time for one short <laughs> question from <laughs> this gentleman here. It's a short, it's a short question. Thank you. Uh, in terms I'll of try and the, do. Um, speculation on the implications of the speed of development of yeah. networks, that on employment and skills for the, yeah. the non-data scientists, the non-mathematicians. Sure. Well, of course, people are very concerned about it. There's the, the, uh, a classic study from Oxford... I don't know, is it three years old now or something, uh, 2011 was it? I can't quite remember, from Osborne and Fry about how the hollowing out effect of artificial intelligence. They looked at the, the whole range of um, professions in the US and they came to the conclusion that almost half of them would be affected by, um, by artificial intelligence. But then more recently, there's, uh, there's been another study which puts the number at uh, more like 10%. And the reason that they come up with a different answer is because they're looking at what jobs will be eradicated by the technology as opposed to the ones that will be impacted. So something in the, it seems like something in this 10 to 50 percent range is what we should think of. So yes, I mean, I think we're getting a bit, uh, there's no doubt it's sort of getting to the scale of an industrial revolution. And so then you would expect all the reactions that you get to industrial revolutions, like, you know, the breaking of looms and uh, um, people, you know, getting upset. And, um, and then, of course, there's also the debate about whether the technology is safe and uh, whether it's going to turn turn on us and some uh you know i would have thought as an engineer that's sort of under control but some very prominent people like martin Re uh, reese and uh 
uh, Elon Musk, who after all makes cars that are supposed to be safe and, you know, have been coming out and saying, well, no, there are really uh, dangers here. I think my view is that any technology which is powerful enough to be interesting is powerful enough to be dangerous. And so, of course, as engineers, you will be very concerned with building safety in an early stage. Okay. I've uh, been asked to say a few words, <laughs> yeah. which will be very, very brief, although I have a piece of paper, it's not going to take me very long. Um, first of all, it's my pleasure to extend a big vote of thanks to Professor Blake for a very interesting and illuminating talk on behalf of the department, the school, the college, and all the guests who attended today. Um, I should say that uh, many of the research priorities in the talk uh, fit in well with the areas that the department is active in. And in this vein, I should mention the recent launch of the Birkbeck Institute for Data Analytics, which was founded to develop interdisciplinary research in data analytics and data science. So we do believe and hope that this uh, interdisciplinary research can uh, complement some of the research going on in the Turing Institute and, and there will be opportunities for collaboration. Okay. I was actually going to tell, I was looking for a Turing joke on, on the <laughs> web, but I couldn't find a good one. Um, so <laughs> maybe d during the dinner, I, could, uh, I don't think I get many laughs for that. But. Um, anyhow, I think uh, I did find a good quote uh, from Alan Turing in the 1950s, which he said, The idea behind digital computers may be explained by saying that these machines are intended to carry out any operations which could be done by a human computer. So I think that's quite fitting with uh, some of the <laughs> Um and um, obviously we're in close proximity to the Turing Institute, so hopefully there'll be other opportunities to get together. I know that some of my colleagues uh, are attending some of the seminars and, and have joined uh, research with some of the people in the Turing Institute. So finally, let us thank Professor Blake uh, once again. For